Chapter 38. We didn't pull into Laguna until nearly six. Snooky insisted upon driving, and as the photo shoot had been a solid ball and I could still pick up Keith's smell on my fingertips, I was in no mood to argue, despite the fact that I hated Snooky's car with all my heart and soul. It was a late model AMC Pacer, all window, a fishbowl on wheels. On a hot day, there was no escaping the heat. And it was a very hot day. Besides, Snooks lived in that car. There were McDonald's quarter pounder wrappers in the back seat that would have required carbon dating. The ashtrays were in a perpetual state of overflow, but it was a good deal roomier than my V-dub and the radio worked, a definite plus for a long jaunt. So I said, what the hay? The car overheated four times on the way, and by the time we reached the beach, we were as hot and gritty as white lines on the road. We pulled into a Denny's for dinner and rubbed off a few layers of freeway from our faces in the men's room. Two friends of Snooky's were putting us up for the night. Just where these two guys fit into Snooky's life was a fact Snooky, Snooks choose, chose to evade, although I managed to gather something about his having met one of them in a sauna somewhere. At any rate, one of these fellows was appearing in a local summer stock production of West Side Story. Two tickets for this production awaited us in a tiny white envelope with Snooky's name on it at the box office of the nearby junior college. James would be meeting us at the theater before the show. James's lover, Brian, who was playing a rab in the show, would meet us after. I disliked James on sight. I very seldom pass judgment on a person at a glance, but when I do, that judgment is carved into stone tablets, unchanging and eternal. James was tall and blonde and good-looking in a cleft chin, long tooth, obvious sort of way. He was wearing a scoop front tank top and a pair of Levi's that had obviously been sandpapered at the crotch. His skin had the touch, grainy appearance peculiar to genuine rawhide wallets and to faces of those who consider sun tanning an art form. There was no doubt in my mind that this man combed lemon juice into his hair on a habitual basis. When he shook my hand, I knew we'd never be bosom chums. For me, a man's handshake must be firm and sure. Shaking hands with James was like grabbing a handful of yesterday's Caesar salad. Snooky, on the other hand, seemed to think James was the very cat's ass. He gushed over James's well. He, ju he gushed over James well past the point of disgust. Had there been an Adrian back little league baseball bat handy, I would surely have broken at least one of Snooky's kneecaps just to stop him from giggling. Our seats were in the front row. And as every stage door Johnny knows, front row seats in almost any proscenium arch theater in America means one of two things. The back of your neck aches for a week to 10 days following the performance where you spend two hours and 40 minutes watching shoes. I never but never sit front row. Snooky knew this one only too well. And as we scooted sideways over a row, row full of feet towards our seat, he shot me a look imploring me not to say anything snotty about looking straight up all evening long. A monument to self-control, I said nothing. Snooks maneuvered himself next to James while I was seated next to a woman roughly the size of a 66 Chevy Impala and her baby. West Side Story has never been one of my favorite stage shows, mostly because I love the movie so much. Who could hope to compete with Natalie Wood's face and Marnie Nixon's voice, not to mention Rita Moreno's legs, George Chakiris in tight purple pants, and the original Jerome Ro Robbins choreography. No semi-professional stage production could hope to compete with that. Still, people keep mounting one production of the show after another, and I seem to be shanghai into going to at least half of them. I've seen Maria played by a black girl and Anita by a blonde. I've seen countless Caucasians in brown face, Max Faxter, light Egyptian perhaps, playing Puerto Ricans. I've seen Officer Kripka played by a woman, and I swear to God, Snooky once took me to a rat-infested, run-down, flimsy excuse for a theater in Hollywood where West Side Story was done in punk rock drag, with the Jets as skinheads and the Sharks in safety pin chic. When Maria walked on stage in a purple mohawk, I walked out in a huff. This production was much more traditional, right off the rack. The AB plus term project for West Side Story 101. The orchestra was abbreviated, the strings, the string parts mimicked by a Prophet 20 synthesizer. But except for the occasional disagreement on some of Lenny Bernstein's more ambitiously syncopated passages, it was okay. Maria was pretty and witty and gay, if a bit shrill. Tony was also pretty and witty, and unless my Bufu Geiger counter was on the serious Fritz, also quite gay. He had one of those warbling nasal tenor voices that made my back teeth ache. 
The last note of Maria demanded a bullet to bite on. The Sharks' Puerto Rican accents owed much to Ricky Ricardo. Both gangs were composed of just the sort of three dance classes a week at Roland Dupree's theater major dance minor at Cal State types I'd come to expect of stock productions of this very, of this and every musical written since before Cohen ever saw the flag. Of all them cute as cocker spaniel puppies with their high, perfect little dancers' butts and baskets bulgy with dance belts, all of them dancing as if the floor had little numbered footprints painted on it, all of them queer as a $3 bottle of cologne. During the When You're a Jet number, one of the jets, the boys without the cafe a latte paint jobs and the Frito Bandito accents caught my eye. It wasn't just that he was the best dancer in the bunch, which he was, or that he was blonde, which didn't hurt, or even that he was as pretty as a three no Trump bridge hand. It was all that. I elbowed Snooks. Snooks, I whispered. Would you just look at that? That's Brian, he said. We're spending the night with him. How nice, I said. The West Side Story cast party was held at James and Brian's immediate, immediately following last curtain call. As cast parties go, it was first cousin to every other cast party I'd ever attended. Lots of beer and cheap wine, pizzas delivered cold, lots of loud music and couples grinding in every possible corner of the house. What set this particular um, party away from anyone I'd attended in high school was that, by my own count, only three couples, including a boy and a girl. Snooks had taken a fancy to the tall, dark, and handsome number who had played Tony in the show. His name was Rex, honest. Straight straight nose, entirely too many teeth, a voice like a Bach trumpet, and a lisp you could shower in. Now, I don't even want you looking at Rex, Snooky warned me on the way from the theater to the party. He'll take one look at that smile of yours and those damn biceps of yours and won't have a prayer. Besides, and I won't have a prayer. Besides, you've got yours at home. Don't worry about me. I think the man is quite insipid myself. I gladly leave this one to you. Well, just see that you do. So when Rex made his fashionably late diva's entrance and made a beeline across the crowded living room to where Snooks and I stood, smiling like there was no tomorrow, I said, excuse me, but I do believe I smell my souffle burning. And I fairly sprinted into the kitchen. Brian was at the sink rinsing glasses. He was even more adorable offstage. Every inch of five foot three, he looked rather like Beanie from the old Beanie and Cecil cartoons, snubbed nose and freckled and cuddly looking as an old teddy bear your mom took away when you were five. He looked up and smiled. Hi, I'm Brian. I know, I'm Johnny Ray, and you were very good in the show. Really? He stopped in mid-rinse. Did you really think so? Yes, I do. You were one of the best things in the show. It was nice not to have to lie. I'd have trouble telling any performer he was good if he wasn't, no matter how cute he might look in a pair of sawed-off Levi's and his lover's too-big shirt, dishwater dampening the front of his short yellow gold hair. In fact, I thought you should have been riff. So did I. That little bitch was sucking off the director. I swear. What'd you say your name was? Johnny Ray. Johnny Ray, you repeated? What's your sign? Capricorn, I admitted, trying not to laugh. What's your sign? I mean, really. You're kidding. Me too. When's your birthday? Christmas Day. You're kidding. Mine too. Jesus Christ, we're sisters. And he jumped up on tiptoe, threw his arm around my neck, his hands dripping warm, wet spots down the back of my shirt, and kissed my cheek. Well, well... What do we have here? Rex sashayed into the kitchen. I'm sure James would just love to see this. Where the hell's the wine, anyways? Over there, bitch, Brian said, one hand still resting against my belly. And you know damn well that that was perfectly innocent. Johnny Ray and I have the same birthday. We're cosmic sisters. I'll bet Rex poured himself a tall glass of Dago Red. Where is James, anyways, Brian asked. Later I saw him as he was rubbing up against half the chorus. Twat. I peered around the kitchen door and spied James against a wall exchanging tongue sushi with one of the sharks. Chico, I think. It was hard to tell with their makeup off. Chico's, hands, Chico's hand was well beneath the waistband of James' gym shorts. I turned to look at Brian's face. It had the look of a car windshield just hit by a BB gun. I hate it when he does that, Brian whispered. I put my arm around Brian's shoulders. He didn't pull away. The last of the guests who were planning to stay the night finally stumbled out around three... 30 or 4. Rex was staying. In what I'm sure he considered a major coup, Snooky booked himself into the second bedroom with Rex. Another cast member, Baby John, I believe, spread a few blankets for himself on the living room sofa, and I unfurled a sleeping bag on the floor nearby. I didn't mind. 
If I'm tired enough, and that night I was really beat, I could sleep standing up in the cheap seats at Dodger Stadium during the seventh inning stretch. Despite the juicy sex sound streaming from under the door of both bedrooms, I'd probably been stretched out on the floor for five or six minutes before dropping off to sleep. I awoke suddenly from some vaguely nasty dream of Keith, opened my eyes, and looked up into little Brian's not-so-little crotch. I was momentarily startled, both from the expected temporary sense of what the Germans call Gefühnheit, thrownness, that clinched where I am I feeling of waking up suddenly in a strange place, and because I had no idea how long Brian had been standing over me, my dick was so hard it hurt. Where from the mental residue of my dirty dream, or from the sight of Brian's genitals dangling over my face like the perfect present on, on the Christmas tree, who could say? Are you asleep? Brian asked, dropping to a cross-legged seat position on the floor next to my head. No, not any more. I popped up on my elbows. What's up? Besides the obvious, of course. Brian cocked his head toward the first bedroom. I was pretty sure I'd recognize Snooky's voice among the sounds of carnal pleasure emanating from the room, attesting to some rather wild goings-on behind door number one. Not into mob scenes, I said. Uh-uh. Me either. One at a time. S'il vous plaît. S'il vous plaît. Um, we sat quiet for a moment, during which I couldn't resist reaching out and touching Brian. He was, after all, so close, so seemingly vulnerable, and so very naked. I ran my finger over the instep, instep of one of his tiny feet, strummed his teensy toes like ukulele strings. You're so small, I thought aloud. Thank you, Brian said. I'm sorry, that wasn't a value judgment or anything. I just... I considered mentioning that Brian's full-size genitalia were all the more striking, set as they were against his three-quarter size body, but decided to drop it. There was another momentary silence. Brian reached over and fingered my hair. When the quiet was pierced through with a particular piercing howl cry from the bedroom, Brian quickly jerked his hand back to his lap. James loves me, Brian said all of a sudden. Whatever else he may do, James truly loves me. Brian's voice had raised in volume a bit. I glanced over to the couch where slept where slept baby John? He didn't stir. My erection had finally subsided, allowing me to sit up and face Brian without embarrassment. Of course he loves you, I said, more out of a spasm of cosmic sisterly comfort than out of any real conviction concerning James' alleged love for his diminutive roommate. We're going to get married, Brian says. Married? How do you mean? I mean married in the church. My first impulse was laughter. As that seemed quite inappropriate to Brian's tone of voice and facial expression, I held it back. Married, I repeated. Might one be so sold as to might one be so bold as to inquire why? <clears throat> I'm from Tennessee originally, Chickasaw County. I was raised up in the Baptist Church. Where I come from, when two people love each other, they get married. I looked into Brian's eyes as well as I could in the semi dark. The boy seemed dead serious about this marriage thing. Now, I was raised in the Baptist church myself. I briefly considered pointing out to little Bri that, to my knowledge at least, the church was not in the practice of marrying male couples, <clears throat> but thought better of it and said nothing. We'll get married, Brian said with some finality. It's only a matter of time. I was hard-pressed for a comeback for that. Brian believed... Brian relieved me of the responsibility. You know something, he said? <sighs> I've never been attracted to a black man before. He reached over and stroked a soft, slow little road down my chest. I watched in silence as his chin-like hand moved down my front, leaving a prickly sensation trail in its wake. He'd really caught me looking the other way with that one. You have a very nice body, he said, tracing a particularly prominent vein in my right bicep with his finger. You have beautiful genitals, he whispered, cupping my balls with one little boy hand, not quite encircling my cock with the other. No one was more surprised than I when Brian spit into his hand and began stroking me. I took hold of Brian's plump, pretty dick, and we just jerked each other off like a couple of nasty schoolboys. I came quickly. I'm coming, beanie boy. I clamped a hand over my mouth for fear of waking baby John. Funny thing, but as I blew my wad all over my own belly and Brian's fingers, the face I saw behind my, behind my tightly clenched eyelids was Keith's. Brian shot nearly up to his face biting down hard on his lower lip and clenching his sticky little fist. We wiped each other off with wet paper towels in the kitchen, smiling and giggling, touching and kissing. Would you hold me, please, Brian said. Just please hold me. And hold him I did. I sat on the kitchen floor, back against the cool enamel of the stove, and held the little boy 
the little boy man close all night. Brian smoked cigarette after cigarette and we talked and talked about love and sex and marriage and the childhood horror of having the same birthday as Jesus Christ until we could see the sunrise over the kitchen windowsill. <laughs>